Let's turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 8. We've made our way in our study in the book of Hebrews now to chapter 8. And what an interesting chapter this is. We're going to consider the whole chapter today for our text. And so we're going to begin reading in verse number 1. And we'll read down through the end of the chapter. And just by way of review, as you're turning to Hebrews chapter 8, we have been working through the whole book of Hebrews. And as we began, we saw that the thesis, the theme of the book, is that Jesus is better. Jesus is superior. He's better than the angels. He's better than the Levitical priesthood. And much of the argument that is laid out in the book of Hebrews surrounds the fact that Jesus has a superior priesthood. And we talked in our last message a couple of weeks ago about the Melchizedek priesthood, really over the couple of weeks that even preceded that. It's a kind of an extended argument about how Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And the author of Hebrews goes into great detail explaining why the Melchizedek priesthood is superior to the Levitical priesthood and why Jesus is the recipient of that. And we even talked about how we believe, based on what we read about Melchizedek, that Melchizedek most likely was Jesus himself as a pre-Bethlehem appearance of his person uh, before he was born into the world. And so many similarities there. And, And we see that he has this superior priesthood. Now we come to chapter 8, verse 1, and the author is going to make this statement about the sum. He says, now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. Now we're going to pause right there because before we read the chapter, I want you to understand what he means by that phrase, the sum. He's talking about the culmination or the pinnacle, the highest point, what we we would sometimes refer to when you're writing a story as the, as the high point of drama, you know, have everything that's leading up to it, and then you have the moment when everything is revealed, and then you have the conclusion. Well, what he's coming to in chapter 8, and it's really going to be here in chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10, is the high point. It's the pinnacle. It's the culmination of all that he said before. Now he's going to put it together and he's going to explain to us why Jesus is so very important. And he's made a lot of statements along the way in chapters 1 through 7 leading up to this point. He's going to draw it all together here in chapters 8, 9, and 10. And he's going to tell us, now this is the sum. And so let's keep reading. We have... Such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For, see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Don't you like verse 6? For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand, to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind, and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, 
know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. With the Lord's help today for the next few moments, I'd like to speak to you for just a little bit about the more excellent ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. We noted in verse 1 that the author of Hebrews points out that he is coming up to the entire point of everything that has been said up to this place. If you want to understand where he's been, then we're going to look at chapter 8. If you want to see where he's going, then we're going to look at chapter 8. Because this is really the sum. From here, he's going to develop some further thoughts about particularly the superior sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which will be the theme of chapter 9 and chapter 10. And that is uh, just a, a fabulous couple of chapters. I'm not sure how long it'll take us to get through there, but to some incredible, incredible truth. But chapter 8 is really the encapsulation of the whole book, of everything that is being said. In other words, Jesus is better. How is Jesus better? Well, in chapter 8, we find three things about Jesus that point to the fact that he is superior. And when we say he's better... We mean he's better than the Mosaic system. He's better than the law. He's better than the religion, that people, uh, the things that people can do in their own strength. He's superior to that. And all of this comes together in a culmination in these couple of chapters. So today we want to consider three thoughts from Hebrews chapter 8. First of all, we're going to review the fact that we have a better priest. I'm not going to dwell on that a long time because we've already talked about it in the last couple of chapters, but I don't just want to skip over his statement here in chapter 8 about the fact that we have a better priest because he's still dealing with that. Second of all, we have a better sanctuary. And he talks about the fact that there is a different place of worship, a different sanctuary where Jesus is ministering. Finally, third of all, we have a better covenant. And he talks about the importance of this covenant and compares it to the old covenant. And so let's think, first of all, about the fact that we have a better priest. He says there in verse 1, about Jesus, our priest, we have such an high priest. Now you'll notice that the word such, which is used here in chapter 8, verse 1, is the exact same word that is used in chapter 7, verse 26, when he said, for such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens. Now, a couple weeks ago, we expounded verse 26, and we spoke in more detail about those aspects of Jesus' priestly ministry. But suffice it to say that the author is reminding us that kind of a priest, the kind of a priest that we need, the kind of a priest that could identify with us, but the kind of a priest who could take us from where we are to where God is. And by the way, what good does it do us to have a priest who leaves us where we are? See, Jesus has the ability to identify with us, but he's not leaving us where we are. He's taking us to God. And this kind of a God, this kind of a priest... Boy, they're getting an early start on the fireworks, aren't they? <laughs> this kind of a priest is the kind of priest that we need. And he makes a statement in verse 1, this is exactly the kind of priest that we have. This holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, higher than the heavens priest, is the one that we have. Now I want you to think about that for just a moment. We have. Present tense. Amen. We have such an high priest. Amen. And I want the truth of that phrase just to sink in on your mind for a moment. We are not hoping for this kind of a priest. We are not looking forward one day to this kind of a priest. We have such an high priest. 
He is, if you are saved today, He is your high priest. He is my high priest. When we, when we knelt a few moments ago and we went into the presence of God to His very throne, it was because our high priest said, you're welcome here. We have this high priest and He's a better priest. He's such an high priest. And then He says in verse 1, who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Now we'll talk a little bit more in chapter 9 and 10 about his exaltation, but that's what he's indicating here is that Jesus, our high priest, is given a preeminent place. This place at the right hand of the throne of majesty, the right hand of the throne of the Father, is a, is a seat of authority. It's a seat of the recognition of power. It's a seat where uh, everyone who comes knows that the person on that throne is preeminent. The person on that throne is exalted. Now, this is an, an interesting uh, blending of two thoughts. We have Jesus as a high priest who is accessible, but we have Jesus as a high priest who is above. A high priest who is in a place of authority, a high priest who is in a place uh, of, of reverence and worship, a high priest who is given a place of, of great recognition. So he's identified with us, but he's above us. And when it says he is set, it means that his work has really been finished. It's been completed. It's not as if Jesus is offering sacrifices over and over again. He offered one sacrifice forever and then he sat down at the right hand of the Father, which is exactly what it's going to say in chapter 9 and 10. So he's reminding us this priest is one who is set on the right hand. But then he is also described in verse 2, this priest as a minister, a minister of the sanctuary. And again, this is two truths that are wedded together. They, they don't even seem to go together. How can he be put in such a high place, in a place of exaltation, but then he's described as a minister. And the word minister means he's a servant. He's one who serves others. And, and this is the incredible, uh, you know, the, the blending of, of Christ as man and God. He's fully man. He's fully God. He, he is God and he's worthy of worship and praise and glory. And yet he esteemed that. He, he set that aside and he came to this earth and he made himself of no reputation. He took upon him, himself the form of a servant. He's made in the likeness of man. And because of this, we, we look with wonder at Jesus and we say he's both set on the right hand of the throne of majesty and he's also a minister, a true minister of the sanctuary. You think about his service. Now, if you go down to verse 3, it talks about the fact that as a priest, he needs something to offer because the priests on this earth, and at the time of the writing of the book of Hebrews, the, the temple would have still been in Jerusalem. The priests would have still been offering sacrifices in that place. It would have, this book would have predated uh, A.D. 70, when the temple was destroyed for the last time and hasn't, hasn't been rebuilt all right, uh, since that time. But at that time, the temple was still in its place. The priests were still exercising their office. And he makes this argument in verse 3 that if Jesus uh, would, were here on this earth as a priest, then he needs something to offer. As a priest, he's got to have something to offer. Priests offer sacrifices. Hebrews chapter 7, again, if we refer back to verse 27, reminds us that this priest, Jesus, his sacrifice pertains to, uh, if you look there, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once when he offered up himself. So what is the sacrifice that our priest offers? It is himself. And we're going to find specifically, particularly in the following chapters, it is his blood. It is his blood that was shed on the cross, which he offers before the Father. And he says, this is the covering. This is the payment. So he comes with a sacrifice, with a gift. And then this better priest in verse 6 
is described as having a more excellent ministry. But now he hath obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. When we think about the ministry, the service of Jesus, the way that he serves us, his ministry is excellent. There's no fault in his ministry. And we talked about this a little bit when we were comparing the priesthood of Jesus with the priesthood of the Levites. You could often find faults in their ministry. You could find areas where they did not measure up to the law of God themselves. That's why before the high priest could offer any sacrifices for the people, he first had to offer a sacrifice for himself and for his own sins. But you'll not find that to be the case with Jesus. His sacrifice is for your sins and mine, not for for his sins. He has a more excellent ministry. So in every way, Jesus is a more excellent, he is a better minister priest. But then there's an interesting statement that's made in verse number two about a better sanctuary. And the word sanctuary refers to, uh, in particular, the holy of holies. It's it's the term that is used to refer to the most uh, inner part of the tabernacle and later of the temple where no one was allowed to go except the high priest. And the high priest could only go there one day a year on the day of atonement. It was covered over with a thick curtain, and no one was allowed in that place. But that one time a year, the high priest would go in there, and he would go to the Ark of the Covenant, which was in that sanctuary. And there, there was the mercy seat and and the cherubims that were there and all the articles within the Ark of the Covenant. He would take the blood from the sacrifices that had been made, and he would sprinkle it there upon the mercy seat, and it would be symbolic of the fact that the the people's sins needed to be covered for that year and that they by faith were looking to God to cover their sins and the priest would go in there. Now, notice here that he's talking about the sanctuary and this is exactly what the Hebrews would have thought of would be that inner sanctum of the temple, the place where none of them had ever been before. But it says about Jesus that he is a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read phrases like that, it gets my curiosity going. What is this talking about? Because he's clearly making a contrast between the sanctuary in the temple that all of the Hebrews would have been familiar with, that they would have said, that's in Jerusalem, that's the place where we go to worship, but he's making this statement, this is the true sanctuary. Now, I want you to just stop for a moment and appreciate how jarring this statement must have been to Hebrews, who all their life had been told that the true sanctuary was in Jerusalem. And now what the author of Hebrews is saying is, there is a sanctuary that is true, and it's not the one that you're thinking of. Wait a second. Hold on. What are you talking about? There is a true tabernacle and a true sanctuary. So this would have got their curiosity. What is he talking about? The Hebrew believers who are being addressed in this book had always been taught and had even argued that Jerusalem was the place where you went to worship. The the true Holy of Holies was there in the temple. That was not to be replicated anywhere. In fact, they would argue heatedly with the Samaritans, wouldn't they, about where the true place of worship was? And if you want to know about that, you could look in John chapter 4. We'll not go there this morning. And you could reference the discussion between Jesus and the woman of Samaria about where is the true place of worship. This was a point of discussion. And the Hebrews said, no, it's Jerusalem. That's the true place. And now the writer of Hebrews says there's a true sanctuary, but it's not the one that you're thinking of. It's in a different place. In fact, this true sanctuary is in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. It's a place that the Lord built. It's not a place that man put together. Now, I don't know what you're getting out of verse 2, but to me, it seems very apparent that what the author of Hebrews is talking about is a supernatural place. It's a place that is not on this earth. 
It is a place that is not symbolic. It is a place that is real. Now, he builds on this truth because he goes to verse 5, talking about the earthly priests and their ministry. He says, "...who serve unto the example in the shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle." Here's what God said to him. See, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Now, you know what a pattern is, right? Last year, my boys helped me, and we made a couple of Adirondack chairs. You know what an Adirondack chair is? It's real comfortable. It's a great place to sit and have your cup of coffee in the morning while you read your Bible and relax a little bit. And so we made... Adirondack chairs. Before we made the Adirondack chairs, we had a pattern for exactly the shape that we, that we wanted the, the legs in particular, and then the curvature of the seat. We wanted to replicate all that. So we had a pattern that we used, and we took that pattern, and we traced that out on some wood, and then we cut that out, and then we used those wood patterns to superimpose over the pieces of wood that we were going to make. And we traced them out. And then in that way, the, the chairs that we made are identical. They, they are exactly the same. They're made according to a pattern. So the pattern is the thing that you use to make it. And, and the pattern is, is, if you want to put it this way, it's the rule or the standard. We want it to be this way. So now God said to Moses, when you make the tabernacle, Moses... I want you to make the tabernacle after the pattern that you saw in the mountain. When you were up on the mountain receiving the law, you, you saw a pattern of what it was going to look like, and I want you to make it after that pattern. In other words, this wasn't like Moses thinking, hey, it would be really cool if we did the curtains this way. It would be really awesome if we, if we made the brass laver in, in this fashion, if we, if we did this with the altar, if we made the Holy of Holies. No. If you read in the book of Exodus, God was incredibly particular about exactly how that tabernacle was to look. That's right. And he said this to Moses, don't you dare make it any different. It has to be exactly like I told you. Now, pray tell, why would God be so concerned that it be made exactly according to pattern? According to what God expected. And you say, well, it's probably about worship and, and God is particular. And, and that's true. But I'm going to tell you something else that's in this passage, which comes out very clearly, is that God has in mind, he wants this which is on the earth to look like something that is in heaven. And he is telling Moses, you make it this way and don't make it any other way because I want people to see what they cannot see. They're going to look at this down here and they're going to understand something about what's up there. Now, we don't have time to go to the book of Exodus, but if we did, my, we would find that in every aspect, that tabernacle, which was described to Moses, is a pattern or a type. It's representative of Jesus himself. And we would see how all of these different instruments within the, t the tabernacle, the way that it's constructed, even the measurements, the, the way that you go in, all of these things, the, the ministry of the priests, everything that surrounded the tabernacle was for the explicit purpose of people understanding one day when they saw Jesus, Jesus is the true minister of that tabernacle because that tabernacle matches up to him. It's a fascinating study. So we have a true sanctuary. It says in Hebrews chapter 8 that where Jesus is ministering is in this true sanctuary. Where is this sanctuary? It's not in Jerusalem. By the way, that temple doesn't exist anymore, does it? They're, they're going to be rebuilt it one of these days, but that temple doesn't exist. The sanctuary that is being spoken about in the book of Hebrews is the sanctuary in heaven. It's in the presence of God the Father. It's, it's in the place where God the Father is at. And Jesus is there ministering. You say, what is his ministry? He's our mediator, our go-between. So when we think about Jesus as a minister, as a priest, 
We think about this sanctuary, and, and you say, what, what is it that is better about this sanctuary? Well, the sanctuary here on this earth was symbolic. It was a pattern to point to the real sanctuary. Now, I want you to think about this. If you could go to the real place instead of the place that was patterned after the real place, which would you rather go to? Let's say, do, you, do any of you like pizza? Like pizza? I like pizza. So we, we went to a museum last year, year before, with our kids, and it was a kids' museum. And in the kids' museum, they had a pizza shop. And it was patterned after a pizza shop. And so they had ovens that didn't work. And they had pizzas that were printed on cardboard. And they had money and cash registers and tables and all this cool stuff. And you could go in there and the kids could play pizza shop. Now, that was pretty nice for the kids. But the whole time I was there, I was thinking I would much rather be in a real pizza shop. <laughs> Why play when you can have the real thing, you see? Well, why pretend when you could actually eat pizza? That's just how I think about it. Now, when you think about, could, if you had the chance to go into the presence of God or to go to the place that represents the presence of God, which would be more powerful to you? And, and I know, you know, it'd be interesting, wouldn't it, to go to the tabernacle? or to go to the temple to see what it looked like, to view it for ourselves, to walk around. That would be pretty awesome. It'd be incredible. But I want you to understand that though we cannot do that, we have something better because we have actually been invited into the true sanctuary. Amen. We've been invited into the very presence of God, and this is a better sanctuary. Now, we can't see it with our physical eyes. We can see it with the eyes of faith. This is where Jesus is exercising his ministry as a priest. He's in the presence of the Father. All that was on the earth was only representative of that which is in heaven. Now, this, this idea of, uh, if I can find it in verse 5, the example and the shadow of heavenly things, I want to save that thought because we're going to come back to that in, I believe, chapter 10, verse 1, and we're going to talk about how the law is a shadow, but Jesus is the fulfillment. But he's, he's giving us a hint of what is coming in chapter 9 and chapter 10. So we have a better priest. We have a better sanctuary. But then third of all, we have a better covenant. And he spends the, the, the greater portion of Hebrews chapter 8 talking about the better covenant that is offered. Now, you understand that everything about the nation of Israel, the Hebrew people, is predicated upon the covenants of God. And we saw something about some of those covenants, how God uh, swore with an oath. He promised. He, he swore that it would be so. We saw that in an earlier chapter. And that gives us two immutable things which tell us that God could never lie, that God is definitely going to keep his word. We know that God keeps his covenants. But now he's going to make this point. He's going to say those covenants, as precious as they are to the Hebrew people, are not good enough. We need a better covenant. And you say, well, wait a second. I thought those covenants because they were given by God and he'll never lie and he can never change and he swore and he promised, I thought that those covenants were good enough. No, those covenants are insufficient. Those covenants don't fill up everything that God wants to promise to his people. And you say, what is, the, what is the problem then? Why, if God is that kind of a God, why are these covenants not sufficient? The problem is not with God. The problem is with the people that the covenants were offered to. And this is the point that he's going to make here in Hebrews chapter 8. So look in verse 6. He says the covenant that Jesus is the mediator of is a better covenant. And it has better promises. For instance, think for just a minute. The covenant that was given to Israel involved a land, a physical land, a king, a posterity. You understand all those three things. That would involve the Abramic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, 
the Davidic covenant, the three pillar covenants to the Hebrew people. But you understand that the covenants that Jesus offers through his sacrifice on the cross offer a better land, a better king, and a better posterity. Isn't that something? They're better promises. They're, it's a better covenant because they're better promises. Now, we, we do want to point out in verse 7 that the, the first covenant, he says, was not faultless. There was a fault or a, a problem with that first covenant. And as we've already pointed out, it's not that the fault was with God. It's not that the fault was with the covenant that he gave, but rather it's with the people who received that covenant. And the, and the, the problem was they couldn't live up to their side of the covenant, which is the point that he brings out in the following verses, because in verse 9 he says, Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not. So you remember what happened, right? Jesus, uh, the Lord took them by the hand, it's described here, and he brought them out of the land of Egypt. He brought them right up to Kadesh Barnea, to the brink of the promised land. He said, here's the land, go in, God is going to give it to you. And what did they do? Nope, not going in. We refuse to obey. And so he regarded them not. He said, okay, if you're not going to obey, then you will not inherit the land. Your children will inherit the land. You're going to wait 40 years now. I'm not going to be with you. I'm not going to allow you to have that land. They refused to go in and God refused to give them the covenant. You see, the problem was not with the covenant. God had every intention of keeping his promise. They didn't keep their side of the promise. Verse 8 tells us that this promise was made specifically with the nation of Israel and with the house of Judah. So I do want to point out to you that though there are implications of this covenant that pertain to Gentile believers, the predominant emphasis in the book of Hebrews is the covenant that is given to Hebrews. The covenant that is given to those who will recognize that Jesus is their Messiah. And they also have a Hebrew heritage. There's a, some special promises that are going to come to them. There's a special covenant that is going to come to them. Now, we can be thankful that we are made partakers of many aspects of this covenant by faith. And the book of Romans deals with that, that we are made partakers and part of the family of Abraham by faith in Jesus Christ. But it is also true that this covenant is predominantly made with the nation of Israel. And you say, what is this all about? Well, he talks in verse 10 about this particular covenant being him putting his laws into their mind, writing them upon their hearts. And then he says, I'll be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And in verse 11, they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord. Why? Why won't they teach this? Because everybody's going to know him. All shall know me from the least to the greatest. What is he talking about in verse 10 and 11? Well, he's referring back to a prophecy from the book of Jeremiah where God says the time is coming when I'm going to give a new heart to the children of Israel. I'm going to give them a, a, a new mind. I'm going to write my law right in their heart and they're going to be my people. What is he referring to? He's referring, I believe, to the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. That time when the, the nation of Israel will be restored and Jesus will rule over them and they will see him as their Messiah. They will worship him. So that's the, that is the full culmination and fulfillment of this promise. But you do understand that in a soteriological, in a salvation uh, sense, there is an application of this promise to us today because we likewise have a better covenant. Now again, I recognize that many of us, most of us in this room, do not have a Hebrew heritage. But there are implications to these promises to those of us who are not Hebrews. To those of us who are children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Now if you look at verse 12, he says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities while I remember no more. I want to remind you that the covenant that is being established and spoken of is a covenant of mercy. It's a covenant, can we say it this way? It's a covenant of second chances. A covenant of renewal. And I just want to say this morning, aren't you thankful that our high priest 
gives second chances. That he gives, uh, for many of us, third chances, fourth chances, fifth chances, 129th chances. He's merciful. He's long-suffering. Now, don't, don't presume upon the mercy of God. Don't assume that his mercy, it, it, you know, that you'll just always have a chance to come to him. If, if you're not right with him, you ought to get right with him today. But understand that he deals with us according to mercy because if he didn't, there wouldn't be any of us here. His covenant is according to mercy. God would be right to have written off the nation of Israel, to have cast them aside, to totally cut them off, to find a new people. But the Bible says that one day he's going to restore them because he deals according to mercy. Verse 13 tells us that this new covenant makes the first covenant old. The first covenant is decaying. It's waxing old and it's ready to vanish away. It's going to be swallowed up in this new covenant. The new promise that pertains to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You say, what is that all about? Well, here's the thing. With a covenant, there there are terms to a covenant. A covenant is like a contract, only stronger. Because you can get out of a contract with a lawyer, but you can't get out of a covenant. So you have a covenant... And the covenant has terms that have to be met, have to be agreed upon, and then have to be followed through on. And we talked about how the covenant to Israel ultimately is an unchangeable covenant because God promised and he said, I'm going to keep it. No matter what, I'm going to keep it. Now, not necessarily with that generation that failed, but I'm going to keep it on into the future. But what we find is if we were left to ourselves... And and let's say the covenant was, um, you can have eternal life. Nick, you can have eternal life. But in order to have eternal life, you have to keep the law. Okay, so the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20, it's not hard. All you have to do is keep the law. No problem, right? You're a good person. Now, wait a second. If that's the covenant, how many of us are going to make it? How many of us are going to be right with God? If the covenant is, you can only approach to the throne if you are faultless. Not one of us. Not one of us is going to make it. So what is it that makes this new covenant a better covenant? Because this new covenant is not predicated upon our obedience. It's predicated upon the obedience of our priest. And how obedient has our priest been? Perfectly which is what he's going to prove in chapter 9 and 10. Our priest has kept the law completely, and now he says, instead of relying on your merits to gain favor with the Father, you rely on my merits. I ran the race. I finished the course. I completed it. You rely on me by faith and you will be accepted by the Father. This is why it's a better covenant. Because the old covenant, there was no hope. But the new covenant, there's abundant hope. Now you say, I don't know if I fully understand this. I don't don't comprehend exactly what you're saying. Okay, then you have to promise to come back. Because this is what he's going to lay out in chapter 9 and 10 about this new covenant and how Jesus and his obedience is is the... the payment for that covenant, it's not, it's not reliant upon us measuring up. It's reliant upon him. And he has already measured up. He's already paid the, the full price. He has already satisfied the Father's demands. Therefore, there is hope. This is why we have a better covenant. You see, I thought these covenants, you know, that they pertain primarily to the nation of Israel. Well, some of them in some aspects absolutely pertain to the children of Israel, but I want you to understand that when it comes to having a relationship with God, there are covenants which are given to us, promises which God has made, we could say with the words of the author of Hebrews, better promises that we can cling to today, and you don't have to be a Hebrew to partake of those. You have the opportunity, according to the book of Romans, to be grafted in 
and to receive the benefits of the promises of God that are made to the nation of Israel because of Jesus. But this is the thing about chapter 8. It's all because of Jesus. It's a, it, he's a better priest. It's a better sanctuary. It's a better covenant. But it's all about Jesus. If at any point you take Jesus out of the equation, it no longer exists. There is no priest that can get you access to the Father except Jesus. There is no sanctuary that can replace the true sanctuary. There is no other covenant that measures up to the best covenant that is available through Jesus. And this is what a lot of people struggle with. And this is, I think, what the, the crux of the matter was in the book of Hebrews. There were people that were thinking, I could have the promises of God. I could have the covenant. I could have the good things that God is offering. And I could just set Jesus to the side. Jesus isn't that important. No, to differ with you, to challenge you, none of it is possible without Jesus. You take away Jesus, all the promises go away. All the better things go away. Because Jesus is the center of the whole plan of God. We must have Jesus. We can't set him to the side. We can't ignore him. We can't disregard him and hope somehow to be right with God. Today, many religious people are finding their hope in an earthly religion with earthly statutes and laws. Instead of by faith looking to Christ, and yet even now, Christ is in that sanctuary, the true sanctuary, and He's offering for you to come to be reconciled to the Father. While down here on earth, people are working and laboring and, and striving to try to be accepted by God, Jesus has already gone and he's prepared a place and he said, come and you'll be received. And people say, no, I don't want to go that way. And this is the problem. This is the problem. People say Christianity is too divisive. Christianity is too exclusive. Well, I'm not sure what you want God to do. He's provided a way for you to be reconciled with Him. And you're essentially saying to Him, I want what you're offering, but I don't want it on your terms. Right. So why do you think He is obligated to say to you, oh, never mind, you can do it however you want, right. when He has provided a way? If you refuse Jesus, there is no other option. And this is exactly what the author of Hebrews is saying. You must come through Jesus. You must come to Jesus. You must come by Jesus. Jesus is the central truth that we need to comprehend. That's why when you hear somebody preaching some gospel, what they call a gospel that doesn't include Jesus, you can be sure it is a false gospel. It is an untrue gospel. It is a false way of hope, and it will not actually materialize. It will not actually be able to deliver on its promises because a gospel that is devoid of Jesus is a gospel that is devoid of power. That's right. We cannot save ourselves. We need a Savior. Amen. We need a priest. And that priest is even now in the true sanctuary inviting us to partake of the better promises the better covenant that he is offering. It's all about Jesus. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. and Thank you for the ministry of Jesus. Would you help us, Lord, as we contemplate these great truths to recognize today that without Jesus we have no hope. Father, it's the birthday of our country and we're thankful to be Americans. But may you help us to understand that being an American doesn't make us right with God. Father, we're, we're thankful that we're Baptists. We're thankful for our heritage as Baptists. But help us to understand, Father, that being a Baptist doesn't make us right with God. We're, we're thankful for pure religion and undefiled, for the opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth. But, Father, help us to understand that religion doesn't make us right with God. 
Help us, Father, to see Jesus. Help help us to see Him in His rightful place. Help us to lift Him up, to worship Him, to humble ourselves before Him, to take hold of Him by faith, recognizing that He is indeed the only way, the truth, and the life. Father, I pray for those who are here today who have never been saved. They've never come to Christ in faith and repentance. I pray that you would help them to recognize the power of the gospel today. I pray that the Spirit of God would plead with them about sin and righteousness and judgment and that they would come to a place of kneeling before your worthy person and accepting the free gift of salvation that you offer today. Have your will and your way in each one of our lives. Father, we're about ready to go into a time of fellowship here. And we ask that you would watch over us, give us safety, watch over our words and our actions, nourish our bodies with the food that we'll partake of, help us to give glory and honor and praise to your name in everything that is said and done in the balance of this day. We love you and we thank you for all that you've done for us and we thank you for the privilege of assembling here together today. And we ask and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.